Good evening, church. Welcome to tonight's live stream. I'm looking forward to digging into God's Word together. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 4 here in a little bit. Uh, before we get there, I want to keep you updated on what's been going on at our church uh, and how you can help in different ways that we have been a blessing to our community as a church as a result of your giving, your generosity, those of you who've been volunteering. And a lot of you already know the different ways that you can help, but if you don't, I'm going to remind you of a couple of those, and then I'm going to share with you some things we're looking forward to as a church. Most of you know you can drop off peanut butter and jelly as well as ramen for kids in the community. That is through Mercy Drops. You can drop it off here. We've actually set it up where our front doors are unlocked, but then our entry doors are locked. So that's, we were at, at offering 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., but a lot of you have been asking for, for evenings, for earlier mornings. So basically any time now, if you want to drop by the church, that front little foyer section will be unlocked with a small table there where you can drop off. And then during the day from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. again, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there'll be somebody here. And then different days, there'll also be other people here. But make sure you know if you need to drop it off anytime time now, you can do that in that front foyer. Peanut butter and jelly and ramen is going to be donated to Mercy Drops to feed kids in our local community. And then all non-perishable food that you want to bring by, absolutely bring it by. And we'll be keeping that for people in our church who have needs or people that we know of who have needs. So if you're a part of our church, listen, if you serve on the dream team or you're a part of a small group, we want you to know if you have a need, reach out. And I'm, I'm so blown away by the generosity of our church. I've been encouraged. And I know that all of us want to be generous and give away. But when you have a need, when something comes up, please speak up. Let us know how we can help. And we want to be uh, generous during this season. We want to encourage you uh, to continue giving, certainly. And you've done that. Uh, some of you have been mailing in your tithes and offerings. Some of you have been giving via text. Others have been giving online. And then also we want to encourage you to volunteer to check on others. Uh, while I was talking about giving, we, I've got a couple things here because I'm not always up on these things. Those of you who give via text already know this, but some of you may not be aware. You can text any amount to that number there, uh, 298-7886, of course 757-298-7886, and then you can set up text to give, and we take care of all the costs for that as a church. So all of your giving will go toward the church and making a difference. You can give towards benevolence if you want to give toward that, and that'll be one of the routes that we use to purchase food and supplies for people who need it. A lot of you have already used online giving. That's available at restoreportsmouth.com slash give, restore.church slash give. You can find it on our website. There are lots of different ways to give. I want to thank you guys for being generous during this season. And I want to say this, and our first, we just ended uh, the first three months of the year, and we are still up compared to last year because your generosity continues to grow. And I know we're only a few weeks into this, and I was talking with some pastors this week, and, and one of them was really encouraged because uh, people have brought by their tithes and offerings. And that has allowed a lot of our churches, and the churches that I'm aware of, to, to lead with faith, not fear right now. So we are leading in, leaning into this season, and we know that God's going to use us to be a blessing to our neighbors, to our community, to those around us. So we're looking forward to the opportunities that we have, and we can only do that because of your generosity. We've been able to keep continue supporting our missionaries. We've been able to continue supporting the church plants that we support because of your generosity. So that being said, I want to tell you about a couple of things coming up. Um, we're launching online groups in the next few days, and our, our group leaders are getting together and figuring out how to use Zoom. Some of them are going to use different uh, things to con communicate before they Zoom together. Some of you will be on Facebook Messenger. Some of you already have a group message going on. Uh, I was a part of a Zoom meeting last night, and it was really encouraging to meet with some of our leaders that I hadn't seen in a while. And I'll say this, I miss seeing people, and I'm sure you do too. That, and that's one of the things I really want to say as we get, get started tonight is I am faith-filled. I am absolutely hopeful. Every Sunday morning we're doing this series based on hope in the midst of a crisis. But I want to say this as your pastor. Hear me say this. It is okay to mourn. It is okay to cry. When we look at scriptures, we find people who absolutely had faith and they had hope. But we also see people who for a season mourned. They cried. They put ash, like sackcloth and ashes on. They were, they were hurting. So I don't want you to hear me say, hey, we should have hope. Hey, we should have faith. I'm saying that while we mourn too. I am mourning. I've been talking with some leaders this week and some of them have told me, look, I just start crying and I don't know why. It is hard. It is difficult. This is probably going to be the hardest thing many of us go through in our entire lives. And really, it's, it's not like it's physically hard. We're just, we're just staying up. It's emotionally draining. It's difficult on our souls. It's hard on our hearts. And we miss each other. We miss seeing people. We miss everyday normal life. We miss having the security that a lot of us took for granted. So 
I want you to hear me say this. Yes, I miss people and we're mourning and we have hope, we have faith, but we are mourning in this season. But at the same time, we're going to do the best we can with what we have. Thank God we have technology. Guys, if this had happened 30 years ago, there's no way for me to communicate with our church, for us to continue our Bible study series. There's no way for our groups to meet online. 30, 40 years ago, this would have looked very different. We do have some technology at our disposal today that we wouldn't have had a while back. So I'm thankful. I'm grateful for that. Um, another thing looking, I'm looking forward to this weekend that you can look forward to. Uh, this is the last time you're going to see me alone. All right. Uh, I, I have been uh, fever free and I have been feeling better now for close to two weeks. And this Sunday will be, have been two weeks since I've been sick. And so uh, there are going to be some new faces on the live stream with me. There will be music this weekend, which I know we're looking forward to. And uh, we've got a really big announcement this Sunday that, that I'm looking forward to sharing with you as a church, something that we've been working on for a long time that started way before COVID. And um, it, not exactly the way we wanted to present it to the church, but we do have some announcements that we'll be sharing this Sunday that I'm looking forward to. So I'm looking forward to that, and, and I know this season is hard, uh, but we're going to make the best of it as a church. And so that being said, uh, I'm going to invite you to open your Bible to the book of Galatians, and we're going to continue our series in Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to be talking about how to, be, how to live free because we're set free, and really we're going to transition this week. We're going to talk about maturity, the gospel and maturity. What does that look like? What are we talking about? So whenever I talk about maturity, I always use an illustration that Paul's actually going to use in this passage. He's actually going to mention straight up the idea of growing up when you were a child and then when you were immature and then when you grew up and were mature. And whenever we talk about maturity, I always want to use these two words. There's two words that come to my mind. There's liberty and there's responsibility. So when I was 16, like many of you, I got my license, right? And there was this little bit of freedom this liberty that I now had, but it also carried with it the weight of responsibility. I had to put gas in that car. I had to drive safe, right? Because I was on my parents' insurance and every little thing I did, if I got a ticket or if I got into an accident, man, it was going to explode their insurance premiums. So there was new liberty, but it came with responsibility. And that's the idea of maturity that Paul's going to talk about here. The gospel brings about this maturity in us. It gives us this liberty, but that also carries with it some responsibility for knowing the word and understanding what it looks like. So I want to talk about this idea before we jump right into the passage. There are a lot of Christians who look mature on the outside, but they're actually not mature. And this is kind of the problem that we're all, we always have with maturity. Maturity, or I'm sorry, immaturity. Immaturity often carries itself as if it is mature. And that's what's happening in this passage. The Judaizers had come in and told the Galatians, hey, you're actually more mature if you obey the law too. You're actually more godly. You're actually more religious. You're actually a better Christian if you do these things. And it sounded good and it looked good. And immaturity does that. Immaturity has a way of looking mature and sounding mature. Remember when you were a teenager and you thought you knew everything? It's because immaturity convinced you that you were mature. Remember as you got older and you turned 25, turned 30, and you start to realize, man, I didn't know anything, and you start to actually grow up. Part of maturity is understanding that there are new things to learn and you don't know it all. And so immaturity often carries itself as mature, and that's what had happened in this, in this church. People had come in and brought immaturity with them. I want to say this real quick about Christians. Too many Christians have the idea or the look of maturity but they're actually immature. And here's what I mean. I have met a lot of Christians who could quote all kinds of scriptures. They grew up in church. They went to church every Sunday, every Wednesday night, man, they were there and they look mature. They even act mature, but they're not mature. They, they have the, the, the looks of it, but not the depth of maturity. Here's what I mean. They can quote scripture. They know when to go to church, but deep in their heart, man, they still struggle with hate toward their neighbor, toward their loved ones. They, they know how to act Christian and put on the right clothes to go to church. And they even read their Bible every day. And they're quick to tell you that they've read X amount of chapters that morning, but the word never gets into them and actually transforms their heart. So when we talk about maturity, it's not just knowing God's word, it's God's word changing and transforming me. All throughout the scriptures, we see not just the knowledge that comes from the word, but the word leads us to repentance. Uh, the Holy Spirit always leads us to not just know more and do more, but to repent and to be more like Christ. So when we talk about gospel maturity, I'm not just saying, have you memorized verses? I want you to do those things. I'm not just saying, do you read your Bible? I want you to do those things. 
has the word, has going to church, has doing all of these Christian things actually led to life change? Are you more like Jesus than you were before? Because that's the goal of maturity. Not just to look and sound like a Christian, but to live and operate as Jesus did. To be loving, to be generous, to be forgiving, to be merciful, to be kind-hearted, to be faithful, to be hopeful in the midst of crisis. Like this all works together and it doesn't just happen. It takes a process of time, just like you and I growing up took a process of time, right? Our bodies grew quicker than probably our minds, our emotions, our hearts, and that's the issue. Becoming a mature Christian takes time. So I want to jump right into Galatians chapter 4 and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Uh, Paul is still continuing the argument we left off with last week. He's like, look, we're talking about identity. We're talking about becoming heirs. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Three words there that are powerful, all right? You, I don't like when anybody calls me a child. We all have an aversion to the word slave. We don't want to see that. We don't want to hear that because it carries with it such weight, and, and, and it's a negative word, and it was a negative word when he used it there. And then he says, the word heir, which we all love, the idea of getting an inheritance, having something, uh, receiving something. And so three powerful words. He says we're an heir, but as long as he's a child, he's no different than a slave. This was the idea. Back then when we talk about adoption, we think now of adopting children. And that's awesome and it's beautiful. And we have people in our church who are going through that process, others who've already gone through that process. It's beautiful. But back in their day, they actually would adopt adults, not just kids. What would happen is if somebody owned a lot of land, ha had a lot of bond servants, or even slaves in this case, somebody who owned all kinds of materials, of land, of companies, whatever it is, they would adopt another person, a human, a grown human. And a lot of times it was actually one of their bond servants or slaves. It was somebody that worked for them. And they would go to them and they'd say, listen, I have no children. This, all that I have is going to get, man, just eaten up by everybody else. I want it to go to one person, so I'm going to adopt you as my own son. But it, here's the idea. Until he came to be full grown, until an heir is fully developed, he's no different than a slave. He's just somebody else on the property, though he is the owner of everything. So it's kind of like a kid who's growing up on the property that he's going to own one day. While his dad is still around and he's still a teenager or a child, he has the same level of freedom or responsibility as everybody else working there. It's not until everything comes to fruition or maturity. He says, but he is under guardians. So it's the idea of maybe the dad does pass away and he leaves behind his fortune to a child or a teenager. Well, they have guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So there's this looking forward to this maturity, this moment where everything is going to come to fruition, and that's the day they're looking forward to. By the way, this is the idea of maturity. We are always looking forward to the full maturity in Christ. So when I get to heaven, I'm not going to struggle with sin. When I get to heaven, I'm going to understand, like everything's going to be beautiful. That's the full maturity in Christ. But we're moving toward that date. We're looking toward that date. We're looking forward to it. But then he changes a little bit, and he, t he takes the illustration a little further in verse 3. In the same way, we also, when we were children— we're enslaved to the elementary principles. We're going to talk about those words of the world. This Greek word here can be interpreted two different ways. And I think it's a little bit of both. And um, it, the first way is obviously like we think of elementary principles. The ABCs, the one, two, threes, the things we all learned as children. That is definitely conveyed in the Greek wording here. But another thing that's conveyed is really this idea of principles, kind of principalities, the spiritual forces at work in the world. When we talk about the elementary principles at work in the world, uh, this could also be interpreted the spiritual warfare side of the world. Right and wrong, angels, demons, heaven, hell, God, and Satan. And I want you to hear me say this, church, as your pastor. I absolutely believe in spiritual warfare. I've been talking with some leaders this week, and some of them are discouraged. And I'm telling you, I just knew right away, like, this is not physical. This is not, this is spiritual. This is a spiritual battle for your soul because they were having nightmares, and they're the type of person that never has dreams like this. And I told him, I was like, man, I'm praying for you because I believe this is spiritual. And so when he talks about being enslaved to the elementary principles, there's two things here. Yes, we're all like, we're all living in a, a world that is governed by the elementary principles or the laws of gravity, of time, of space. Yes, but there's an underlying principle here too of there is the right and wrong, angels, demons, heaven, hell, God, and Satan. There are forces at work behind the scenes. See, we're humans and we're capable of sin. We're capable of awful things. We do them all the time, but there are also forces at work 
behind the scenes, demonic spirits, not just like the spirit of fear, not just the spirit of hate, but the idea of this, these forces at work that when, when, when Paul talks about the New Testament, we, we don't wrestle with just flesh and blood. With principalities, there are things going on that we don't see. Guys, I, I do believe that behind the scenes, there are angels, there are demons, there are things at work here, and, and there are people who've been oppressed. We've all heard stories of people who've been possessed, and I've talked with pastors who've dealt with that. I've never dealt with that as a pastor, and I'm, I'm actually grateful and thankful that I haven't come face to face with that. But these things do exist. They're, they're out there. And so he says, you were enslaved to these things. Guys, we have all, uh, we all have a story of being saved from our former lives. And these Galatians, man, their former lives were filled with not only idolatry, but, but all kinds of false doctrine and false uh, religious practices that were cult-like. Some of them had offered sacrifices to false gods. Others of them had partaken in religious ceremonies that were cult-like in their sexual nature. I mean, just some gross things that were that had enslaved them, and these were the elementary principles of the world. But then he says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law. Jesus came, and we often forget this. Jesus is in the New Testament, what we read about him, but he was born, right, before he's crucified and resurrected. He's still under the law. And to redeem those who were under the law, so that we, we might receive adoption as sons. This is that good news that he was talking about. And they, 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 they understand this illustration. They knew what it was like to watch a slave, a bond servant, someone they knew who had nothing, be adopted as a son by a wealthy landowner, by a wealthy individual, and all of the benefits that came along with it. So he says, guys, we were enslaved. Use that word and understand, you were enslaved to elementary principles of this world. You couldn't get out. You couldn't undo the sin you were doing. Like you, you had no way of just stopping and being a better person. Like you were bound by sin, by forces around us, by the forces from within us. But then Jesus comes to redeem those under the law. And he comes under the law. Like he comes and fulfills the law. He not only uh, abides by the law, he fulfills it so that he could redeem and forgive it free us that we might receive adoption. It'd be one thing if he just freed us from the way to the law. He not only freed us from the way to the law, he adopt, brings us into this place of adoption as sons. We've talked before about how that sons back then got a better inheritance. That's why it doesn't say adoption as sons and daughters. Paul knew that if he used the word sons, they'd know you're getting the best inheritance. Guys, we get the best from God. We are ad adopted as sons. Whether we're a man or a woman, we are all equal in this. We get the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the down payment on the adoption that we are receiving. It's this this gift on the front side. And so when we're saved, we receive the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. And this is important, guys. This is emotional. This is spiritual. This is the idea that we can go before God and we can call him our father. Now, I know that some of us grew up without a dad in the picture. And so understanding the weight and the beauty of having the God of heaven, the creator of the universe as our father, for some of us, that illustration falls short. And if that's you, I'm very sorry that that like me, you grew up without a dad in the picture. However, I would say this. This is what God intends us to understand about a father. He is loving, he is generous, and the Holy Spirit is our down payment so that we can actually cry out to God. as We can talk to God, we can speak to God as our father. And, and I, have, I have a stepdad now. I've had him since I was uh, 16 when my mom married. My mom and him got married. And when I talk to my stepdad, I know that my stepdad loves me, cares deeply about me, would do anything for me. And he's a great picture of a father. And here's, here's what he does. He loves me. He's generous. And when you cry out to your father, you know your father loves you and cares for you. And so this illustration is meant to show us we have a father who cares for us. He goes on in verse 7. So you are no longer a slave. So stop acting like it. Stop living like it. You're not bound by those elementary principles anymore. But a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Remember those three words we used earlier? Here they come back again. And he's saying, you are not a slave. You're a son and an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. He says, guys, you were enslaved to things that were not good that we're not righteous, that we're not holy, that we're not God. So we have been taken from enslaved to sin, 
to the spiritual forces that work behind the scenes that encourage sin and encourage hate, division, uh, war, poverty, just all the awful things in the world that we come up with on our own and that spiritual forces behind the scenes push us toward. He says we're no longer enslaved to that, but we were, but now we're not. He says, now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, let's stop right there. It's one thing to know somebody. Like there are tons of people that I know, right? I just know them. But to be known by them, for them to mention you, for them to know you, for them to love you, it's kind of like uh, the idea of all these people who have fans, but they don't know their fans. The idea that they get to meet that person. They get to, to, to be known by them. So we no longer just know God. We are known by God. The God of heaven, the God of the creator of the universe knows you, loves you, cares deeply about you. And this is where Paul flips his argument again. He says, how can you turn back? Why do you want to go back to the law? The law was a guardian. The law was a manager. The law was always meant to bring us toward the gospel, to bring us toward Jesus' fulfillment. This is the good news. This is the date set by the Father. This is the good stuff we've been looking for. And now you want to go back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more. So this is why I said there's two ways to look at these elementary principles, because now he's kind of lumping the law in with those elementary principles. So Pastor Mark, are you saying that the law, the, the Old Testament law is satanic, is demonic, is, is of that? No, and that's why I believe that it can be, it has both of those meanings there. It's the idea of it is an elementary principle. There have always been laws, there have always been rules, and it was, it is something that is base or lesser than the good news they're living in now. It was the manager, it was the guardian to bring us toward the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, we were not only under that principle, we were also under the laws of gravity, the laws of time and space, and we, many were enslaved to sin and sinful nature and the, the idea of the demonic forces at work in our world. Whose slaves you want to become once more? He says, you're kind of rejecting the demonic forces. You're kind of rejecting the devil and Satan, sure, but you're trying to go backwards toward the law. It's kind of like this. Some of us idolize our high school experience, right? You just loved when you were 13 or when you were 10. And certainly there are memories that I have that I cherish. I met my wife and we started dating when I was 13 and, and I love those times. But I, I don't want to go back there, okay? Because to go back there would mean less freedom, right? I'd have to go back to school. I'd have to turn in papers. I, there, I, would, I would not have the freedom that I have now. Now certainly the, the liberty that I enjoy now carries with it responsibility, but that's part of being mature and having maturity. We've moved on. We don't want to go backwards. We don't want to go back there. We've grown up. And he's saying, you guys grew up, you came to the gospel, and now you're trying to go backwards to these elementary principles. You want to be slaves to this again? Verse 10, he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. And that, that's kind of, that carried some weight there. It wasn't just the idea that they were obeying the dietary laws. It's like they were obeying these days and seasons and months and like certain times of the year you had to do this and you had to do that. It, it was very all-encompassing how this legalism had crept in and robbed them of their freedom and said, you have to do this, this day, and this, this day. Verse 11, he says, I'm afraid I may have labored, labored over you in vain. Now, this is bold. He says, I may have wasted my time in sharing the good news of the gospel with you because you're just going backwards. You're undoing all of these things. He says, brothers, I entreat you. He says, man, I'm going to be personal here. And by the way, every one of us needs somebody who's per who loves us enough to be personal and to entreat or to approach us this way, to approach us boldly. By the way, if you're a Christian and you just go to church and you just listen to worship music, but no one can confront you when you're doing wrong, you don't have godly community set up in your life. You, you enjoy preaching, you enjoy teaching, you enjoy music, but no one can confront you, then you've missed out on the biblical understanding of the church community. That's why we should be in groups. That's why we should be on serve teams. That's why we should be around people who love us enough to tell us when we're screwing up. Because if you just go to church and aren't known by anybody, or if you just watch videos online and nobody has any way to approach you, I'm telling you, you're missing out. So Paul says, I love you enough to approach you with this. He says, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. He's getting real personal here, and he's sharing some personal stories. He says in verse 13, you know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. We're going to talk about this bodily ailment 
Uh, many have wondered what the thorn in Paul's flesh was. Uh, he's going to talk about his condition here. And through, th- though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. He says, guys, you loved me. You loved me as a brother. And so I'm approaching you with boldness because I believe you still love me. He says, what then has become of the blessing you felt? He says, what changed? I I leave for a little bit of time and now you don't want to hear from me? You you, you think I'm leading you astray? For I testify that if possible, you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. This gives us some insight. Uh, One understanding is that possibly the ailment Paul struggled with was eyesight. And so he mentions here, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. And and that's a pretty good uh, way to look at this passage. He says, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? He says, you loved me so much that you would have given me your own eyes when I was struggling with my eyes. And now have I become your enemy for telling you the truth? Let me say this. If you live a life where no one can tell you the truth without becoming your enemy, you're going to be lonely. You will not develop. You will not mature. And this is true of everything. Like, Some of you right now, you're watching, you're kind of like on the fringes. You're not really sure about faith. I want you to understand this truth is true of every area of your life. If you want to be a better basketball player, but you're not coachable, you're never going to improve because no one can tell you what you're doing wrong. If you want to get better in the area of finances, but you think you know everything, and every time someone tries to sit you down and talk to you, you say, no, I know what I'm doing, and they become your enemy, you're never going to grow. And this is also true in the Christian faith. The moment that I turn everyone into an enemy for telling me the truth, and by the way, Sometimes it's the truth about us. Paul is absolutely approaching them with the gospel truth and telling them the truth about God's word, but he's also telling them some truths about themselves that they don't want to hear. I need pastors, leaders in my life who are willing to confront me when they see pride, when they see arrogance, when they see hate, when they see jealousy, when they see greed, when they see things in my life that could derail my ministry, hurt my marriage, and affect me spiritually. I have friends who do that. And guess what? It doesn't feel good when they do it. And my first thought is, oh, they're out to get me, but they're not. And I know they're not because most of them I've known for 20 some 30 years of my life. So you need people who can approach you. So I want you to understand a couple of things. We're in a spiritual battle, and and one of the easiest ways to lose a battle is to deny its existence and and not even know you're in a battle, all right? The enemy would love for you to think, look, I'm not in a battle. There's nothing going on here. The enemy is here to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. That is what Satan exists to do, and that is what his goal is to do. To your family, to you as an individual, to our church, his first plan is always rebellion. And by the way, that's where they were. They were in rebellion against God before the gospel, right? But then they get saved, and so plan A goes out the window. They're no longer rebelling against God, so plan B for Satan is always, if I can't get you to rebel, I'll move in with some false doctrine or some legalism in this case. Because then I can keep you so busy, you never actually grow into a mature Christian. This is what I was talking about earlier. There are some Christians who they spend so much time doing church, doing religious activities, good things, and they think that these are what's saving them, that they never actually develop and grow. The idea of maturity, I said earlier, it's liberty and responsibility. The hardest part about being mature is knowing what to do. And so that's why some of us are bent toward legalism, because we want someone to tell us what to do. That's what happened here. They found it easier to follow rules and lists of the Old Testament than to abide in liberty in the New Testament. Paul talked often about some things that people argued over, whether or not to eat the meat that was offered to idols, uh, whether or not to drink around certain Christians. And so he would always point it back to, you need to be led by the Holy Spirit, but that's hard. And people would write him and say, give us a yes or no. Give us black and white. We don't like gray areas. We don't like depending on the Holy Spirit. And the freedom of the gospel, the liberty of the gospel carries with it responsibility to be spirit-led, to lean into what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do in our lives. And so I want you to hear me say this. It is not always easy, and that's why some of us bend back toward legalism and just, church, give me rules. Church, give me lists. Church, tell me what to do every day of my life because we don't, we don't like the responsibility of maturing and growing as a believer, reading the Word, following the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, have I become your enemy for telling you the truth? And he talks about the other side. He says, they, these legal, legalistic Judaizers, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. He says, they're telling you what you want to hear. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. He says, all they're really doing is using you as a number. They're going to go back to, to 
Jerusalem and say, yeah, we got those, those Gentiles to act like Jews. Yeah, we got some more people to abide by the law. He says in verse 18, it is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. He says, they are so zealous that it's attracting you. They're so energetic about getting you to abide by the law that you have misinterpreted their zealousness, their energy for good doctrine. It's not. He says, we need to have good energy. We need to be energetic. We need to be passionate about something, but for a good purpose, for the gospel. And this is what we see today in the Christian church. We have Christians who get passionate. They get zealous about every single purpose under the sun except the gospel. They they just do. Some of them, it's politics. Man, we got got to win the nation by by taking back this political party. For some, it's it's the cause that is nearest and dearest to their heart. And by the way, I vote, but politics do not rule my life. For some of them, it's it's a cause that is close to the church and close to their heart. And so they're like, man, I am going to give all of my energy and all of my passion to this thing. And sometimes it's good things but it's not the best. And that's the gospel here. And Paul says, the law was good, but it's not what rules our lives. And I just want to ask you this. Is there something that you have taken all of your passionate energy and thrown into that is actually robbing you of your freedom, your liberty, your grace, your maturity in Christ? And here's what I mean. Legalism, sin, uh, the, the spiritual forces at work in this world, they always offer us this high hope. This, if you do this, you'll feel this way. It'll look this way. It'll be this way. Now, this week, I went home with my wife a lot, and every night at, at uh, about 8 o'clock, we just decided we're going to start watching this tiny house thing. And I've never seen it. So we, every night, we're watching this tiny house thing. And uh, it's amazing how many of these couples talk about when they get their tiny house. They're like, when we get a tiny house, we're going to be able to travel. When we get a tiny house, we're going to have more money. When we get a tiny house, we're just going to love this way of life. And, and they're looking at the camera saying, everything's going to be so different. And then they, they meet back with them after they select their tiny house. And they're talking about how their life is just so different and changed. And it's all because of this house. And I, I always, at the end, I look at my wife. I'm like, in three months, that tiny house is going to be full. Or that tiny house is not going to be small enough. They're going to want one even smaller. We have things that tell us if we get them, man, our life's going to be so different. And it's been incredible watching. And look, I'm not against tiny houses. Like, (laughs) I started looking at them online. They look super interesting. But I'm not here to tell you that my life would be so different if I I could travel more. Your life is never going to be so much better because of this thing or that thing. Some of us believe that about a job, about money, about this, about that. Legalism is the same way. It tells you, oh, you're going to live like this. It's going to be so much better, but it can never deliver on that promise. It never can in the way that the gospel can. He says, and not only when I am present with you, he says, I I don't want you to just be passionate about the gospel when I'm with you. I want you to be passionate about it. But then in verse 19, he says, my little children, he's going to use this strong language, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth. He says, I feel like I'm raising you all over again until Christ is formed in you. This is maturity. We are to be little Christs, Christians, believers who model and live out a godly life that honors Jesus. Verse 20, he says, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. He says, guys, you're confusing me. You are, you're frustrating to me. And we're going to pick up there next week as we close out this series. Uh, But I just want you to kind of ruminate on this thought as we close out this idea of maturity. The goal of being more like Christ, it will frustrate us when we aren't there. And it should frustrate us, especially if we begin taking steps backward. Now, what I have found to be true in the Christian life is the same thing that's true in most areas of my life. I am either growing or I'm going backwards, right? Uh, when, you're, when you're in high school and you're playing a sport, uh, there's this se- there are seasons of development, seasons of growth, and then you get out of high school and you don't play for a while and you are declining. You're losing your speed, your edge, your game, whatever it is. Same is true physically, right? Uh, a lot of us just want to maintain, but we often find ourselves in a season. Right now, I'm certainly in a season of gaining weight because we are spending so much time at home and there's always a snack available. Um, so we find ourselves in seasons of either growth or loss, right? Either taking steps forward or taking steps, it's really hard to just stay in one place. And the same is true in our spiritual walk. We need to be 
fighting to mature and grow in our Christian faith. Now, there's a couple of ways we do that, and uh, we always talk about them. Reading your Bible, uh, absolutely. Uh, right now, attending church online is the best, closest thing we can do to, to going to church, being involved, uh, serving others, um, spending time in prayer. Uh, but I want, you, I want to point you back to your deposit. We have the Holy Spirit. It's a deposit on, a, on this, this idea of being an heir and the adoption and the inheritance that we have. This Holy Spirit is our down payment to show us that we have been adopted and that we are heirs. So let me close in this way. If the Holy Spirit is the deposit, I want the Holy Spirit to be what satisfies me. I don't want, in their case, in Galatians, I don't want legalism to be what I look to for satisfaction because there'll always be more to do. That's the frustrating part about legalism. You never do enough. You're never good enough. You're never doing enough to earn God's favor. And so as we close, I just want to ask you what satisfies you most in life. Where do you find your satisfaction? Where do you find fulfillment? I hope it is in God and maturing as a believer, but ultimately I hope it's in this idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. To be full of something, there has to be room. I got this little sign in this uh, little set we've set up here, and it says, empty yourself of God. I'm sorry, empty yourself so God can fill you. I think we might just be in the hardest, longest season many of us have ever faced. And what may be a little discouraging is that we can't fill our time with busyness, with the things we were doing, There's no new sports to watch right now. We're being entertained for a little bit, but Netflix gets boring. We've listened to our favorite songs a hundred times. And so our soul is longing for satisfaction from something that is deeper than momentary entertainment. Our hearts are longing to be satisfied in ways that they haven't been satisfied lately. Some of you are in quiet moments and quiet times. I have found that in my life, when it's quiet and there's longing, it's often moments like that that God can get my attention and focus my attention on areas that I have been looking for satisfaction that haven't been satisfying me and maybe some areas where I've pushed God out of my life and I need to empty that part of my life of me so that I can fill it with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pray in just a second. But before I do, I just want to ask you where you find your satisfaction. Is what you've been telling yourself, everything will be fine if we can just get back to work? Is what you've been telling yourself, I'll be satisfied once I can get out and about again. Once I can go do whatever I want. Maybe you have found satisfaction in longing for what we had. Over the last few weeks, it's been abundantly clear that this, the security, the comfort, the, everything we had was so fragile. It took so little to upend all of that. And so it may just be, Christian, if you're watching this, that God wants you to place your security, your hope, your satisfaction in Him and not something that can be taken, undermined, undone, so easily. Where do you find your satisfaction? Could we pray together before we close out this stream? God, you are good. You're faithful. You love us. You love us too much to just leave us in our own mess. You came took on flesh, died and rose so that we could be forgiven, uh, come out from under the law, enjoy the freedom of the gospel. You're generous. You're holy. You're merciful. And in this season, through the hard decisions and difficult days we have faced, I pray that you through the guiding and leading of your Holy Spirit would lead us to find our satisfaction in you. Nothing else. I pray for maturity 
in every believer that's watching this. I pray that they would wrestle with liberty, maturity, but also responsibility. I pray that we would be people who wrestle with your word, spend time in prayer. I pray for those who are hurting, those who are struggling. I pray that we would be your hands and feet where we can. We'd make a difference when we can. I pray that you'd use your church around the world to be light during this dark season. God, we do mourn. We mourn death. We mourn sickness. We mourn division. We mourn all of the difficult things that are in this life. Our hearts long for heaven where there is no sickness. There is no pain. There is no death, no separation. While our hearts mourn, we also hope. God, we pray for a vaccine. We pray for a breakthrough. We pray for the doctors and nurses and medical professionals on the front lines. God, protect them, encourage them, support them. God, give us your eyes to see ways we can help, we can pray, we can be there for those serving during this difficult season. God, bless your church. We thank you for your word. We pray for maturity. Use us to love our neighbors, to care for our families, to be salt and to be light during this dark season. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, I'll see you this Sunday at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. 9.30 we stream on Facebook and 11 a.m. we stream on YouTube. Look forward to a slightly different stream this Sunday morning. Have a blessed week. I love you. We're praying for you. We're going to get through this together. If you have a prayer request, you can click on the prayer request link in the description. Otherwise, look forward to seeing you guys this Sunday.